Thank you for joining my talk. Yeah, it's uh, it's about Kubernetes and the dynamic world in the cloud, and I will talk a lot, lot about some special things about that. Me personally, I co-founded 7D in Wonderloop and was working for 15 years in the online advertising space. And since three years, I'm working in the Kubernetes world and run their workloads at, at scale in, in Kubernetes in a dynamic way. My current, I'm currently working at Cisco in the WebEx AI team. And my patient is really large scale, low latency processing for worldwide distributed systems. What is the challenge what we typically have? This is a business need dynamic scale, even though they don't say it because they want to have the SLA always in time and that you achieve it even on Black Friday and special events. On the other side, they want to have the operational costs under control and likely only just pay what they're really right now using. And they want to have a reliable system what can deliver new features fast. And as always, time is money to get things fast out of the door. The, the operational challenges which coming to us as a in, engineers and operations guys to that is basically that the, uh, the resource requirements of jobs are very different from job to job. And even on the each day or week or months or quarterly, they can be have very different resource profiles. And also if we have problems and needs to catch up or do some reprocessing because of new features or bug fixes, um, we need, uh, we need to want to do this uh, as fast as possible. And with fixed size clusters, which we have traditionally, you um, yeah, you have to schedule the uh, do schedule optimizations a lot, the jobs influencing a lot each other. And on uninterruptible jobs, you also have some problems. And what we uh, ideally wants to have is that each job gets the right resources, what it needs, that they're ind independent as, as possible and have less influence against e each other, that you can can change existing jobs and new jo at new jobs with minimal effects to the runtime, that you don't care so much about idle time of, of your servers because they would go away, that you only pay what you need. And for the, to get this, you need a system where you can add and remove resources in real time, it means scale up and scale down. And then you only pay what you're currently running. And <clears throat> what effects can, can we have such a dynamic scaling system which can grow and shrink? It's, it's basically, if you say you have a fixed budget and you run a job normally with 100 CPUs a full day uh, all the time, the cluster, uh, 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 then you can also say, I run an eight times bigger cluster only four hours and it costs you the same in the cloud and you get your results eight, eight times earlier. And if you say, okay, I, I only need uh, two, uh, two hours, 800 CPUs, then I can spend the rest also uh, 36 CPUs and running some small stuff there or, or do some UI responsive things to that. And you're still under the same operational costs. And on the, uh, the other view to it is you have a static system uh, where you only need basically the full capacity for eight hours and the rest of the day, you only need 40% uh, of the CPUs. And if you do this in a dynamic way, you would save 40% of your costs. And if you then also think about, oh, I need to add something for peak events like Black Friday or other things, if there's a 30% more what you want to need to add, you save 54%. And if you need to add 100%, you even save 70%. So it's a, it's a simple way to save, uh, to save costs. 
And what what basically is the cloud give us that you really only pay what you are using. You can add and remove resources. And this typically also with a minimal no or minimal lead times. We are talking about minutes normally, you, which allows you to change CPU, memory, temp space, SSDs on a, on a, on a frequent way. Uh, to do this is normally a problem that you have to do it very provider specific. And yeah, this uh, is sometimes a challenge. So uh, the most real uh, cost savings out of the cloud you get really if you leverage the cloud in a dynamic way means scaling up and down and in and, and terms. If you run static systems, they are most likely more expensive than on-prems over time if you are ignoring CapEx and OpEx effects. Uh, but there's nothing, nothing for free. If you run a dynamic system, you need to monitor your cost because you pay us what you use. And if your um, system uh, runs uh, under high load, in a traditional system, you would get alerts that the system get overloaded. You might even break your SLA. In a dynamic world, you would get the resources. You still need your SLA, but you would get a cost alert because you're spending more than you have planned for. And in this way, what uh, if you use Kubernetes in the cloud, what it will bring you? Kubernetes looks like a another cluster that we already had in the past, the Spark or Hadoop clusters or Flink clusters. Um, <clears throat> but it has much better cloud support things. It can really do this dynamic up and down scaling via cluster autoscaler. It's in this way really dynamic. Uh, and the other nice thing is you can also run your rest of your workloads, which is not big data on on Kubernetes clusters and makes them also in a very dynamic way. So you get basically one deployment system for, for everything. And the other nice thing is that basically Kubernetes covers you a lot of the provider dependent scale up and down mechanisms because they're implementing this one time and you simply only use it. And you have on your side only Kubernetes dependent deployments which makes you in a way also provider independent. And this, you, with this, you go from, from the VM world or app per VM world to the container world. There are some, uh, all the cloud providers giving you some hosted Kubernetes clusters. This is an AWS EKS in Asia, AKS and Google GKE which is the most sophisticated. And what Kubernetes also introduced the operator pattern to make it simpler to run complex system like Cassandra, Kafka in a Kubernetes environment. And this op operator pattern, it uh, basically takes the operations and SAE knowledge uh, of running complex systems and put it into code. So there are operators available for Kafka, for databases, and also for monitoring stuff. And they, they get controlled via custom resource definitions, which are, which are objects in, inside the Kubernetes system. And you find them on Operator Hub or Awesome Operator and a couple of other sources. Google's helps, Google helps a lot. And they get mostly installed via, via Helm, which is the standard packet man management for, for Kubernetes and tools like Helm file, car customize, uh, simplify your, uh, the usage of that and making also the configuration more dry. What are the big data benefits what we see here is, yeah, you, uh, for your scalable jobs, you can produce far faster results because you're putting more resources for a short time in it and you get um, the results earlier. You have a chance that with data size or load, the compute can grow dynamically. You only pay what you really allocate at that time. You don't so much need to pre-allocate things for stuff what you only need in a raw uh, 
uh, for a short time, like Black Friday. And uh, also, if you have to recover uh, from failed jobs, you can add resources to make this faster. Things. To give you some, some numbers, what it means to run uh, a Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, how fast you get something. So I have here an example with uh, a GKE cluster, 1.18 with 80 node pools defined, and they are all scaled via cluster autoscaler. If a pod triggers a need of a new node, it takes between 30 and 45 seconds to get the pod, pod running on this new node. If you try to start 3,000 pods, which triggers basically 1,000 new nodes, it takes four minutes to get them running. If you need to start 18,000 pods, which large images, which also trigger 1,000 nodes, it takes approximately 17 minutes to start them. And so overhead of a node is typically order two CPUs and 2.7 gigabytes or 5% of the memory, what you have an, as an overhead per node. What, what is the cluster autoscaler really doing? He is responsible to add and remove nodes to a cluster. And for scale, scale up, it basically looks for unschedulable pods, runs a simulation to find the right node pool. Node pool are groups of nodes which have the same profile and uh, do the right decision by uh, via a weight in a similar way as the, as the scheduler is doing. And on GKE, it also includes the price of the nodes and the node with the highest weight or node pool with the highest weight will be used to add the new node. For scaling down, it looks for the underutilized nodes and see if they can be deleted. And to always get the resources what you need, you you should set the, the limits high enough for uh, the specific node pools. Uh, what is always the most uh, more complicated than scale up is scale down. Um, you want to do a graceful shutdown. So it means you don't want to interrupt your stuff if, if nodes want, uh, have to go down because they are underutilized. For that, the cluster autoscaler is looking uh, to uh, that the node is getting underutilized. It's then also checking is it, are there pods with local storage or have no controller, which means they would not automatically get restarted, have a special annotation, uh, cluster autoscaler Kubernetes safe to evict false. Uh, and, and also looking, are there resources somewhere else where the pod can run? And only if this all fulfills an, uh, a node will shut down. So the safest way to avoid that your pod get, uh, get evicted from, from a node is to set this annotation. And even on the uh, scale, scale down, if this has happened, is the pod disruption budget get respected as well as the graceful termination up to 10 minutes. Which, uh, uh, which are both mechanisms for normal up, up applications to make sure that you do a really graceful shutdown. What, what this means for, uh, for, for our big data jobs. Big data, data jobs are they are slightly different. They're mostly really state, stateful and uh, the, the failure recover mechanisms are designed for so that a few nodes get some problems and get restarted or things, things happen. But if, if basically a, a bigger amount of, uh, of the uh, uh, pods get affected, they are, they are really starting uh, struggling on it. And especially if they would do a rolling update, it would be prob probably for your Spark job the worst thing, worst thing to do. And to, uh, to avoid this happened, as I mentioned before, set this annotation and then a node will run until your, your pods are done. 
uh, the Kubernetes scheduler, which is the guy who's responsible to run, uh, to decide which node a pod should run on. And it's basically looking for all nodes and do the hard filtering of the available resources and all the other criteria. And if it figure, uh, find no node where the pod can run on, it uh, markets as unschedulable, uh, which triggers then the cluster autoscaler to find uh, or generate a new node. Otherwise, it basically uh, calculates a priority on on which node a pod should run. And uh, by uh, as a default behavior, uh, it tries to do a very distribu well distributed load across your current clusters. And um, the, uh, this, this means if you run a lot of no nodes which have low, low load, they have get all evenly load on that. This is done pot by pot, which can introduce a lot of latency if you start a high number uh, of pots. And as I mentioned the number before, a, a, a part of, of this high, high number and the high number of pots coming out of the scheduler latency. There are some, some ways where you can influence this by priority classes, but at the end, um, yeah, it's a pot by pot scheduling. But uh, which is a challenge for us for the big data jobs where you basically want, mostly wants to have something all, or, or nothing. Start all my pods of a job or, or none of them. If, uh, if they only partly get started, your job will pro likely not good, fi uh, never finish. And especially if you run multiple jobs at the same time, which get affected by that, you can even reach into the deadlock situation. The solutions to that is one, to use the cluster autoscaler and always put the needed resources to that so that you always can run your pods or use another scheduler, which address this problem, which is basically a game schedule. This, uh, to use other schedulers is basically the solution on very large clusters or if you have limited resources. And why is very large also because very large means you hit limits and at some point you can't schedule anymore. So it's it's the same use case as limited resources. And for that, you need something like a gang scheduler, potentially also with priority queues, something what you uh, know from your old YARN clusters, for example. With, with Kubernetes, you can have multiple schedulers running, and there's also some scheduler plugins available for customizations. To use that has some pros and cons. And uh, the things what you need to care of is each pod must to have, have a scheduler assignment, and much more important, a node pool or a node should be only managed by one scheduler. So you have to make sure that the default scheduler or the other scheduler are not managing load, load on, on the same nodes, otherwise it, uh, it's planned for a disaster. And there are sometimes some challenges if you use provider-based uh, Kubernetes clusters on, on that. Um, there, are, there are some schedulers available. The, the, most common use is the cube batch scheduler. There's based, based on that much more well integrated things is the Vulcano, Vulcano one. Then is also Apache Unicorn, which is also a gang scheduler and target really large, large scale and fast scheduling. And um, in the Kubernetes scheduling framework, there are a couple of uh, scheduler plugins available to do customizations and uh, to get the scheduling influenced in the way you want. The, uh, the alternative way to use the cluster autoscaler is my, my, my preferred way because you always get at the capacity what you need. And 
with that, uh, with that, you don't have all the challenges with the um, uh, to run a second scheduler in your cluster. <clears throat> and this works very well with uh, with all the cloud environments because you get the, the resources uh, uh, you want in in your limits in your quota where you have to look to, and you have to set the uh, max nodes per node pool high high enough that you always have capacity available and have to monitor for sure your quota and your cost. There's a, a challenges, especially for scale down, if you, you run more than one pod per node. Uh, why is that? That has to do with the cube scheduler uh, behavior of the well distribution what I come, come to it. So the preferred way is really that you run one pod per node because this makes also scale down and so on efficient. And with that, you really only have the running resources what you need at the time. The challenge if you are running multiple pods is basically you have to wait until the last pod is gone uh, on the uh, uh, from the node until they can go down means especially if you run multiple jobs at the same time the longest running job is uh, dictating this and also if your pods ending and you are starting on the already running nodes um, you run into the problem that they evenly get distributed by the uh, by the scheduler which also uh, holds the nodes longer than it's really needed you can optimize that by getting str strong Bing pack packing on newer Kubernetes clusters. You can set the auto scaling profile to optimize utilization in GKE, for example, which solves this problem. Um, then, then the next thing to optimize the things is really to use dedicated node pools. It means a node pool which only runs certain workloads, what you want to it. That is, sounds a little bit strange because in, in many how-tos you, you, you read you should not do it, you should let Kubernetes figure out this stuff. My experience is it's better, better uh, in the dynamic world, it's better to use dedicated node pools for more load to make sure that they are also scaling down in a way you are um, you are thinking and you are also uh, much more control the scheduling by that. And creating node pools, basically you add your uh, own labels uh, to it, to, uh, which are there to bind a pod to this particular node pool. And own, la own label helps you also to do upgrades, updates of node pools, because you create a new one which has the same labels and um, and you can then migrate the workload over that. And uh, also you have the names under control, so you are not depending on some Kubernetes changes or provider changes of the labels. And you need also the attains which are needed to block unwanted ports from, from, from your nodes. You should say, set the minimum size of a node pool always to zero, that if you don't use a node pool, you don't have to pay anything. And the max, as I said before, you should set to, to something that you never, never reach, but don't forget your quota. Um, the next optimization piece, what we uh, uh, can do is leverage, uh, set, uh, to, to leverage the default cloud way to separate storage from compute, because this allows you basically to restart your pod uh, with the different resource requests and getting the same data back back from from the storage. Um, and it could be you also with a trick help you to save uh, cross zones network charges if if they are a problem for you. So um, as, uh, as said before, um, big data jobs struggling if a, 
if they're getting a huge percentage of pods failing, which has happened if a zone is failing and you run it across multiple zones, you know, for example, three means 30% of your pods are gone or, or, or getting problems. And um, there's basically a trick if you're using storage, which is accessible from multiple zones like object stores, network file systems, or in uh, GKE, you can use re regional persistent disks, uh, which means you start your job in one zone. And if the zone gets a problem, you restart it in, a, in another zone, which helps you to minimize the uh, network costs as well as reduce the latency <coughs> in the communication between the nodes. Um, with, uh, with a stateful set, which is managed basically your deployment with dedicated volumes per, per pod, basically stateful deployments, um, you have also the, uh, the possibility to change the, the resource requests uh, um, or, or also node affinities tolerations. And if you change this, stay, uh, the stateful set will then take care to graceful restart all your pods, which allows you then to um, uh, add CPU capacity dur uh, uh, during the day or add memory on Kafka, for example. You do a rolling restart and double the memory for the high traffic hours, for example. And because uh, it depends on the workload, how, how, how fast this goes, but you can even do it multiple times a day and basically uh, allows you again to adapt the resource definitions to, um, to your need. And uh, the similar stuff can be done with the, uh, most of the operators which also triggering then restarts, which are yeah, Postgres operator and, and, and so on. So, so, so with this big, da uh, big da data jobs like Spark Flink running at the end in their own Spark Flink cluster. And in Kubernetes, you can spin up these clusters basically on demand. And if you run one, one job in the cluster, and this allows you to specify the size of the cluster per job. You have the cluster per job on demand. And this uh, allows you the right sizing. And with the different node profiles on, on, on different node pools, you can adjust the, the capacity there. And the cluster autoscaler will take care that the resources are available. And the operators make the deployment very, very simple. And, and for Spark, there are currently two interesting operators, what I mentioned here. Yeah, I have good experience with the uh, Google one because it's a very good integration in all the Kubernetes stuff. Um, and if you use Airflow, you have even a native integration to easily use it. And on the others, you have to do a little bit uh, more. Um, yeah, Airflow is a, a very well integrated now with the, with the Kubernetes stuff and allows you uh, to create Spark uh, jo uh, ap applications on demand. There are uh, some, some other tools allow similar stuff. Um, yeah, Flink operators are also available for Flink jobs and also as, as in, in, in the talk before mentioned, there are others as well available. So, so for for storage, there are some 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 hints, especially if you use object stores, uh, uh, because they are scaling right now all automatically. You have uh, you should always reuse your buckets. Always use the same buckets for the same jobs. Use the same pattern. Even do sometimes preconditioning or warm up to allow the high parallelisms. What uh, big data jobs typically need, needing. And also avoid writing to local images and use as for temp local SSDs or things like that. And for the, for the images, um, 
avoid large large images whenever is possible. So try to load the data some, somewhere else, like an NFS server, EFS, or a GCP file store, or even load it, download it from, from, an, from an object store. For uh, uninterruptible jobs uh, on, on Kubernetes, run them as a job or as a static pod, set the limits and the requests equally to make sure that they not get, get affected much by other pods and uh, set the annotation again. And if you want to, to run such a thing, get the Kubernetes cluster like a GKE, have, make sure that you have the cluster autoscaler and add a couple of stuff. Uh, stuff. Then there is here example Helm charts to use. Yeah. And that, that process. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions, let me know.